As cases of violence against women and children increase, gender activists are demanding a solid integrated plan to deal with the scourge. Now, last night during SONA, President Sil Ramaphosa touched on the issue and said progress is being made in the implementation of the National Strategic Plan. This is the plan that was adopted by the Presidential Summit on Gender-Based Violence as well as Femicide. Mandisa Kanyile is the Director of Rise Up Against Gender-Based Violence and she joins us this morning to give us her assessment of the State of the Nation Address, in particular what we said or what was said around GBV. Mandisa, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. As a start, your views of that address, particularly when it comes to gender-based violence and femicide. I think he was vague. Um, he talked about things that we already know. We know we have a national strategic plan for gender-based violence and femicide. We know we had a presidential summit sit on the 1st and 2nd of November. He didn't talk about the resolutions of that summit. One of which, uh, that one of the, the resolutions that came out was that there'd be a 13 billion allocation for the implementation of the national strategic plan that's going to be distributed mm -hmm. to departments. We wanted to hear even at the summit, how is that going to be allocated? Who's res the responsible people so that we know who to hold accountable? Mm. The Still implementing nothing. agent of that 13 billion. Exactly. We've heard very little. So the president, even when starting his speech, he prefaced it even with electricity. He stated that it would not be detailed in that respect. So meaning, is there no greater expectation for him to be too detailed in his speech, or you would say this moment warrants greater detail from the president? I think it warrants greater detail. Not only does it warrant greater detail, we... It, literally what he said was, uh, we have an NSP, we have sexual offences courts, we have two Tuzele care centres, and we had a summit that has resolutions. What is that? That means nothing. It doesn't talk about, one, a, a ring-fenced budget for the implementation of that national strategic plan, which is one of the key asks of the summit. Because it's great to say you have an NSP, but when you can't implement it, what exactly are we supposed to do? But he one said he's heartened. He's heartened by the fact that all of you stakeholders are rallying behind the national strategic plan. Which is true. We are rallying behind the national strategic plan. We are trying to implement with government. We are trying to have a multi-stakeholder engagement around this. So 100%, that is right. What I'm trying to say is, there seems to be, for me, an, an unwillingness to name where we must go for accountability. There seems to be an unwillingness to say, Department of Justice, this is your target, this is when you must reach it, and this is how heads will roll. I want to start talking about consequence management. I mean, for example, this NSP has been around now since 2020. We're in 2023. Okay, so we've lost essentially three years of this national strategic plan. That's the whole reason why we had to have a second gender-based violence and femicide summit in the first place. What is the consequence management? The fact that we still have the same GBV hotspots over a particular mm. period of time. How long must we talk about Lusiki Siki being the sexual violence capital of the country? Why are, is there no funding allocated specifically to that area? Why do they only have one police, uh, why do they only have one mobile police station? In the, the hotspot of the entire country, you know what the issues are. You know what the infrastructural issues are. But for example, we didn't even have um, um, public works minister come and account for why the road infrastructure, which is one of the major issues mm. for why police can't access uh, uh, victims and survivors of GBVF in the Eastern Cape. There was no accountability around that. So I really wanted to see a lot more detail. And I know that he was trying to explain why he was being vague. But for me, it kind of felt like a slap on the wrist, mm -hmm. especially after all of the commitments and the, and the goodwill that he seemingly showed on the 1st and 2nd of November. Mm. He was quite touched, even with the first one. I mean, exactly. We saw him show great emotion when the women detailed what they've been through and even showed their scars. We mm. all remember those visuals. But on the sexual offences courts, he mm -hmm. said that at least they're improving accessibility. Is this a reality on the ground? Are they accessible? Let's talk about what the energy crisis has actually done to sexual offences courts. Um, for example, as you know, um, you require audiovisual in sexual, sexual offences courts. Audiovisual works with what? Electricity. So you now have a court that, for example, could hear, let's say, 10 cases a day. I'm giving a random number. They can only hear cases when we are not being load shedded. So if you have two load shedding cycles a day, you have two hours with magistrates, court interpreters sitting and doing nothing, waiting for electricity to return. Mm. Why? Because the, the departments don't have bu a budget allocation for diesel. Mm. So this energy crisis is directly affecting people's ability to get justice. Mm. So you've done everything right. You've gotten your rape kit. You've opened a case. You've done everything. And for your case to actually be seen in court, mm. 
now is dependent on the fact that we have electricity. You sent away, and people have no appreciation of the bravery it takes, the counselling that you do internally to say, now I'm ready, today is the day I confront the perpetrator. Mm. And then you're told to go back. People don't even understand the internal work that would have happened there. Never mind that some people don't even have money to mm. travel to court. But once you've done the internal work and said, today I'm going to fight for myself, and then you're told, no, it's not today. You're going to prepare yourself for another day to begin your fight. And isn't that secondary victimization? It is. So I really would have liked for him to touch on the issues related to the energy crisis and gender-based violence and femicide. Lighting, for example, lighting in, in our various municipalities. Do you think it's safe for women in this country to walk on dark roads? No. I mean, exactly. Has that not exacerbated our vulnerability? So all of these things, they, they are interlinked. They, there's a marriage between all of these, these crises in this country. The, the effects that COVID-19 directly had on gender-based violence and femicide, we don't talk about that. For example, he talked about how he's recruiting 12,000 new police officers. Does he say why he's recruiting 12,000 new police officers? Because there was no recruitment at SAPS throughout the COVID-19 lockdowns at all. Mm. People died, people retired, people left service, etc. And those people were never replaced. You now have a police officer or a detective sitting with case, 200 cases per person yeah. to the investigate. Ratio is unbelievable. What does that do about access to justice? What does that do for victims and survivors of gender based violence and femicides? It, uh, all of these issues are interlinked. And I really would have liked for him to have that kind of analysis in the State of a Nation address so that we really understand that this energy crisis doesn't just speak to us not being able to make tea for two or three hours a day, but it actually touches on the vulnerability of women and children. Mm -hmm. And then on the National Strategic Plan, he really went on to say the heart of it is the pursuit of economic empowerment for women. Are we seeing that then, at the very least, that at least in some of those initiatives, a great number of women, perhaps not a lot, but a number of them are being empowered? Where's the funding allocation for that? It doesn't exist. It's not there. <laughs> it's not sitting in a particular department uh, where it says, okay, for example, if you are sitting in a shelter for three or four months, um, here is a exit program where, which you can access, where you can have economic opportunity. The, the, the funding allocation to implement the National Strategic Plan for Gender-Based Violence and Femicide isn't there. It's not there. So this is why I was saying, let's have a conversation around this 13 billion that you promised, where is it going to be allocated so that we know, okay, there is a particular economic empowerment project that's going to be channeled through this particular department. And so when it doesn't happen, we know who to hold to account. Mm -hmm. So yes, this, this is all there on paper. I agree, 100%. It's there. It's part of the plan. But in terms of implementation, how do we implement without a budget allocation? <laughs> and the fact that the budget allocation wasn't mentioned in the SONA, but was mentioned at the presidential summit, for me, is fishy. Mm -hmm. per per perhaps it will be mentioned with Treasury. Maybe the Minister Let's of Finance so. will tackle it. Let's hope he does. Mandisa, thank you very much for your time this morning. That was Mandisa Kanyele. She's the director of Rise Up Against Gender-Based Violence.